Okay, so hello, so my name is Jonas Béal, I'm a PhD student in uh, Computational Systems Biology team in Institut Curie, and I will talk about personalized logical models to study drug response. So basically, what we want to do is to provide personalized and qualitative modeling of drug response with scarce omics data. So scarce for us in this presentation mean only one snapshot of mutation and expression data, for instance, per patient. So since data is quite scarce, we would like to, to use a um, parsimonious modeling framework. And in, in this work, we will focus on, uh, personal, on logical models. And so first, I will show you how could we integrate patient data into a generic logical model to provide patient-specific logical models. And then how to use drug data and those personalized uh, logical models to study drug sensitivities and, for instance, rank drug sensitivities for a given patient, or on the opposite, rank patient for a, given, um, for a given drug. But let's start with the beginning. So what is a logical model? So very briefly, in a logical model, you have discrete variables uh, as abstractions of activity level. So in that context, for instance, this very toy model, you have ABC, biological entity, either gene or protein, for instance. And each variable is a discrete, let's say either zero, inactive, or one, active. So that's logical modeling or Boolean modeling. And all these entities are connected by logical rules, okay? Written with and or not. So that's a very uh, simple modeling framework. Uh, then you have different ways to simulate those models. The one we'll use is the, th the, th is the following one. If you're in that, that situation, you have two possible updates. Either you can activate that node, node B, since A is active, or you can inhibit this one, this one. Instead of performing both updates at the same time, synchronously, we choose to focus on one specific transition and to perform updates one at a time. So we have stochastic rates, there, transition rates there, sorry, and then we choose the first transition to occur stochastically. So for instance, if that rate is bigger, it means that we, have, we will have more chance to choose this specific transition and to move from one step from that state to this one. And then we can perform other updates. So we obtain a kind of, kind of trajectory. We have the initial state of our model, then we perform one update that has been cho chosen stochastically, and we only update one node, and another, another, and so on and so forth, until we reach an asymptotic state. So this is a stochastic trajectory. Since the trajectory is stochastic, then it makes sense to perform thousands of trajectories. And that's what we do with the software called Mabos. So thousands of stochastic trajectories to cover uh, the whole state of probabilities. So of course, we have to ensure we perform enough trajectories to cover the, the space in a reasonable way. And at the end, if you focus on one node, for instance, you can observe the time trajectory of your node, and the node score is the probability for that node to be activated when you average all your trajectories. Okay? Each node can be represented as a probability to be activated. Here we will mainly focus on the final score reached by the node. Okay, but this is very generic. Now we would like to personalize this with patient-specific data. So we developed a methodology to personalize logical models, this is called Profile, and basically we propose two main strategies. The first one is very straightforward. We use discrete data, so that's discrete personalization, defined, for instance, based on mutation. So we interpret the functional effect of mutations, so there are databases or software for that. And for instance, for that red patient, if my node there uh, has a loss of function mutation, for instance, a truncating mutation, let's say, then this transition, where you activate the node, is no longer possible, because we will force that node to remain zero during the whole simulation. So we will have only this possible transition in this very simple time model. Conversely, of course, if you have a gain of function uh, mutation there in this node, you will enforce that node to remain one, remain active during the whole simulation. So in a way, you overwrite the logical rule because you force the node to keep the, the, its initial state. So this is a very simple way. Then we also propose a continuous personalization. Because as you may remember, uh, a node in a logical model is that's an abstraction for activity level. So you just need to choose what is the best proxy uh, for your activity, for the activity of your node. It can be 
RNA levels, but it can be also phosphor levels if that's, if that's a protein, depending on your context. So once you identify the best proxy, so let's say that's RNA levels for this gene B, you observe your cohort. In that case, red patient is has a very high level for gene B, so it's supposed to be very active for gene B compared to other, pa to other patients, if your proxy is correct, of course. So since B is supposed to be very active in this red patient, then you will increase this transition rate in order to transform this transition, and then this transition will occur more quickly, in a way, or more frequently. Okay, so that's another way to shape the simulation and to enforce the model in a smoother way to, keep, to, to stay close to what you assume uh, to be the, the, the state of the patient. And of course, you can combine those methods if it makes sense to combine both mutation data and RNA data, for instance, in your specific case study. Now we'd like to apply that with a real model because, of course, this three node is a toy model. So in the following examples, I will focus on a very generic cancer model gathering key players and pathways. So that's a logical model. You have around 100 nodes, OK? And we define four phenotypic readout nodes to help us interpret the model state of the model. So that's proliferation, apoptosis, quiescence, and senescence. So of course, that's very broad for the sake of the example. So that's supposed to model more or less the, how it works in, uh, in basic uh, cases. And now we can play with drugs. We need data for that, so we have we take data from GDSC, so around 600 cancer cell lines, and we focus on the drugs that have a target in the model. Then for each pair of cell line on targets, you have an AUC, which is a metric to measure drug sensitivity. The only thing you can remember is that if AUC is 1, you have no effect for this range concentration. If AUC gets closer to 0, then you have an effect. Then this is what happened in the pseudo plot. So you have your generic model, generic logical model. You take your data from cell lines, and you obtain your personalized models. Then you simulate your models, and you can see, OK, based on the asymptotic state of my model, this cell line corresponding to this model is quite senescent or quite apoptotic, and so on and so forth. So this is in a PCA plot in order to show the four, um, the four phenotypes in the, in the same time. OK, then you add a drug. If the drug has a target in the model, let's say the top right node, for instance, then you can model the effect of the drug in the model. You add the drug, the drug perturbation in the model, and you see what happens regarding to your simulations. And you can observe the drug-induced shift. Without the drug, the, models, the model simulations uh, is there, and with the drug, it's there. So you observe an anti-proliferative effect, for instance, in that case, which can make sense for a drug, for a drug and the an anti cancer drug. To simplify a bit the plot, we'll mainly focus on the shift, and we'll average those 600 cell lines per cancer types to have a better and easier plots. So if it will look like this, okay? So the average drug-induced shift for lung cancer cell lines, for instance, is slightly proliferative or highly apoptotic, and so on. And this is the example, for a very simple example, with MAPE2K1 inhibitors. So the position of the label is, comes from simulations, and the color comes from AUC, so from data, just to provide a point of comparison. So around 0, 0, it means that for all those cancer types, the drug has no effect. MAPE2K1 inhibitors has very few effect on the model. And it makes sense, and the color is quite dark, so AUC is quite high. For skin melanoma, for instance, you have a huge increase in apoptosis. And indeed, skin cancer is supposed to be quite sensitive. So this is the kind of meaningful analysis we can do. In that case, discrete personalization has been done with mutations only. And then you can try to do some retroengineering. And basically, this slide has been um, spoiled or summarized by the previous talk, because there, the explanation uh, relies on mainly BRAF, BRAF and RAS uh, genes, because, of course, uh, in skin melanoma, you have a high proportion of cell lines mutated in BRAF. And of course, BRAF is just upstream of MAE2K1 in that case, so it makes sense. And for, uh, and, for ra and for pancreatic cancer and colon cancer, you have very few mutations in BRAF, but many mutations in RAS. And that's just one, uh, one step upstream in the model. So you also, you, now you are able to reconstruct the story. You observe the thing with the model, and then you are able to go back to the data and see what happens, see what is the mechanistic explana explanation behind what you, what you can see. And the second and last example, basically, another drug, saracatinib, a Stark inhibitor. So this, in this case, basically, we still 
personalized model of mutations, but it makes no sense at all. Kidney cancer is supposed to be very sensitive to that drug, and we are not able to distinguish the behavior of uh, kidney cancer. But this, is, this has been done personalizing with mutations. If we take RNA to perform the continuous personalization, this time it makes much more sense, because this time we are able to distinguish kidney cancer, head and neck cancer, lung cancer, that have a quite important drug-induced shift towards senescence. So in this case, maybe the mechanistic explanation do not rely on mutations, but maybe on RNA in that case, but it could be any other data types. Which brings me to my first take-home message, basically, that we hope we provide a kind of versatile framework to, quali to capture qualitative behavior mechanistically, because we have different drugs, different data types, and we try to integrate all that and to present that in a common framework, since the framework is quite versatile and quite parsimonious. Still, there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, we would like to better decipher limitations of model building, personalization method, data and metrics, because when it doesn't work, it's sometimes a bit difficult to see the, the problem is in the model rules, the personalization method, maybe the metrics, depending on met the metrics you, cho you choose, that's a completely different picture. And last but not least, we would like also to investigate some cancer-specific models, breast models, prostate models, to be able to provide uh, more specific uh, insights. So thanks. I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, the organizers. And if you have questions, feel free to send me an email, ask questions, or discuss that around my poster. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jonas. Other questions? So we'll start. Um, so did you compare to standard statistical or machine learning model, your results, and, and basically? So yeah, indeed, we would like to, to compare to, to standard machine, machine learning. Um, we also try to compare first to other mechanistic uh, things, but usually many mechanistic models use um, perturbation data or much richer data. Mm -hmm. And regarding machine learning, in terms of pure performance, machine learning performs better, for sure. Uh, sometimes that's a bit uh, tricky with mutations, because depending on the algorithm with very sparse mutation data, you can have poor results sometimes with yeah. machine learning. But all in all, in pure performance, uh, I think machine learning performs much better. The idea is much more to, yeah, yeah, to sure. provide a kind of mechanistic explanation. But yes, regarding performance, I didn't show that. But mm. usually, especially with continuous data, we have much better performance. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, do, does your model always converge to a single stable uh, point? That's a good question. And it depends on the initial condition? Sure. Uh, so to make things simple, it depends a lot on your logical models. You can reach also on your update methods, either synchronous or asynchronous. But all in all, let's say you can reach some stable states or cyclic attractors. But it depends on how much time you, you wait, of course. So we need to to ensure we have, we have enough trajectories, but also enough time. But at the end, with those stochastic, we can observe a kind of average of the different stable states where you can reach. But of course, those stable states depend on initial condition. So we have to cover also the possible uh, initial conditions in our stochastic trajectories in order to have a complete picture. Okay. Or to constrain initial conditions if some of them doesn't make sense biologically. That's also possible. OK. So instead of simulations, could you use, as is a Markovian process, could you use, like, just take the eigenvector associated to the first eigenvalue to the matrix? You, you get the stable state at the end if the process converts instead of doing the simulation. Uh, it depends on the, on the size of the model. Sometimes, depending on the size of the model, it could be quite difficult to perform the, the things, let's say, analytically. So sometimes, you have, with these stochastic uh, methods, you have a kind of uh, approximation, a good enough approximation, depending on the number of, of trajectories. So it depends a lot. And also, in asynchronous modeling, sometimes it's a bit, you observe some, some weird behavior. Uh, in synchronous, of course, they have something much more defined, theoretically, regarding stable states and attractors, sometimes. But at least, that's it. with trajectories, we have a, a good enough a numerical evaluation. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So how do you deal with is this uh, gene phenotype interactions? Because some of them sometimes are not uh, uniquely. Because in some conditions, the gene and phenotype interactions are, could be opposite in different experiment conditions. How do you handle this issue? Thank you. That, that, that's true. Uh, this is uh, 
as this happens in the model building uh, step, usually. So in that case, I just present, OK, I take a model on the shelf, and then I perform my personalization stuff. But indeed, depending on the kind of on the kind of um, biological phenomenon you model, you have to take care of the specific meaning you want to put, the specific rules you, have, you want to give to one specific gene or one specific pathway. So when you have very broad models, it's difficult. If you have a very specific topic of interest, then you can try to choose a better one or to allow several di different behaviors and hope that with pers personalization, you will constrain with data either one behavior or the other. So that's depends on your case. Great. So thanks so much, Jonah. So yeah, Jonah talked about large-scale Boolean model, and then you alluded to other type of uh, models. So actually, Fabian, who's next speaker, has done such a model. And as you see, there is I mean, so Trey, so machine learning, also applied. He mentioned to drug response, which will be a talk on Thursday. Now there is Boolean models, and now. Yeah, okay.